And so without further ado, I will, I will introduce our, our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Gil Mylander. Uh, it's a special treat for me because I had the privilege of working with Gil for several years at the President's Council on Bioethics under the great Leon Cass. Uh, Gil, to my mind, is the most interesting person writing and talking about bioethics uh, anywhere today. If Gil, uh, if Gil writes it, or, or uh, you, you should read it. It's essential reading for anyone who's concerned about uh, the body and human identity, bioethics, and the meaning of emerging technologies, or the clinical relationship between patients and doctors. Gil uh, taught at the University of Virginia. He's taught at Oberlin College. He teaches at Valparaiso. University. He served on the editorial boards of the most eminent journals of Christian ethics uh, and has published numerous books and articles, uh, most recently uh, the book Age Retardation, Life Extension, and the Relation. Uh, well, his talk, sorry, his, the title of his most recent book is Should We Live Forever? Uh, the Ethical Ambiguities of Aging, which I gather informs and, and undergirds his remarks this evening, which, is, or which are entitled, of course, Age Retardation, Life Extension, and the Relation Between the Generations. Following Gill's remarks, we will hear from another extraordinary thinker, uh, Dr. Dan Solmazy, who's the Kilbride Clinton Professor <clears throat> at, the, at the University of Chicago. Uh, he is the Professor of Medicine, also the Professor in the Divinity School, as well as the Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. And, and, and uh, Dr. Solmazy serves currently on, um, on the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. So without further ado, uh, Professor Gil Mylander. Thank you very much, Carter. I should always let Carter introduce me, I think, um, to my children, uh, perhaps, <laughs> to uh, get a little respect. But, uh, but I, am, I am pleased to be here. Um, even if the, uh, the title of this talk, Age Retardation, Life Extension, and the Relation Between the Generations, is one of the most ungainly uh, titles um, ever perpetrated. But, uh, uh, but it says what the talk will be about uh, anyway. Um, I thought that before I just launch into uh, the, uh, the paper, however, I should just say a word or two about where I'm heading so that, uh, so that you'll know uh, and, and perhaps uh, uh, you know, be aware as the, as the talk moves along. There are lots of smart people who are thinking about and working on the related questions of uh, life extension and age retardation. Some of what uh, happens under those rubrics can seem uh, pretty bizarre, at least by my lights uh, sometimes, but not everything. Uh, and because it's never smart to bet against scientific advance, it, it's a good idea for us to think about it and take it seriously. Uh, that work raises a, a lot of questions. I'm going to focus on just one of the questions that it, it raises, um, it, the significance of that kind of uh, research for the relation between the generations. That's the issue that I'm going to explore. Roughly, I'll come at it um, from, uh, uh, from three angles. I want to start simply by noting uh, a little bit about what uh, biologists say about the connection between aging and reproduction, since even in our biology there seems to be uh, uh, some implications for the relation between the generations. And although biologists can't tell us what we ought to do, uh, they can inform our thinking in certain ways. And then second, I'm going to think specifically about a virtue that I will call the virtue of generativity. That's probably another somewhat ungainly uh, term. If I could think of a better name for the virtue, I would, uh, I would use it. It may not be the best, uh, best term, but I'll, uh, I'll at least explain what I mean by it when we get there. And uh, I'm going to be trying to think about the compatibility of that virtue with the project of life extension and age retardation. Uh, focusing on the, uh, the life cycle as an alternative uh, to that project. And then uh, third and last, I'll try to ask whether there is anything more and anything a little more specifically theological that we might say beyond just affirming the significance of, of the life cycle. Um, and I'll, I'll use the theological virtues to think about why we have children or, uh, or should have children. So that's, that's where I'm uh, headed anyway, at least as far as I understand where I'm headed, and, uh, and uh, we'll see if it makes sense uh, to you. Why do we age? 
question that I would not have talked about 30 years ago, uh, probably, but uh, it becomes increasingly uh, clear to me that it's an important question. Um, uh, the, the dominant answer today is that of evolutionary biology, and its answer goes something like this. We age because nature has relatively little stake in keeping us alive beyond our reproductive years. Insofar as we may speak of our lives having a point, that point is to be carriers of DNA. And having passed that on to the next generation, we become dispensable. Any genetic trait that is harmful enough to cause death before the reproductive years will have difficulty surviving the filter of natural selection. Those who have such traits are less likely to, to reproduce and less likely to be effective carriers and transmitters of DNA. And by contrast, natural selection will have relatively little effect upon harmful genes if those harms appear only later in life, in the post-reproductive years. Now, of course, we may continue to hang around for a while after we have produced the next generation. But as we do, we inevitably suffer from genes whose harmful effects manifest themselves only in those later years. Natural selection, having felt less need to eliminate them, they accumulate and they start to take a toll on us. We begin to experience the effects of a gradual and generalized physical deterioration. And because nature's interest in us all along has been an interest in reproduction, in the transmitting of our genes, it has paid relatively less attention to maintaining us beyond the years that are needed for that task. Focusing on reproduction rather than maintenance, nature has not bothered to weed out changes that make us more vulnerable to disease and death. Changes such as a uh, weakening immune system, increasingly brittle bones, uh, clogged cardiovascular system, deteriorating sensory systems, those are all part of the natural process of aging, but they are, are also closely linked to a wide range of diseases, pneumonia, fractures, heart disease, hearing and vision loss, and so forth. Biologist Tom Kirkwood has labeled this account of why we age the disposable soma theory. And the idea is that from the point of view of genes attempting to transmit their DNA to the next generation, the body is not much more than a carrier. It's disposable and is not made to survive indefinitely. It will eventually die anyway, so not a lot should be invested in sustaining it beyond that reproductive task. Disposable soma is a label that is actually worth our pondering a little bit. It may sound mechanistic in certain ways, but actually it's pervasively marked by metaphors drawn from human experience. So for example, it's really human beings, not genes, who have a point of view. It's not genes, but living organisms that have purposes and goals. It's human beings, not genes, that care about a next generation. And if the body seems, from the perspective of this theory, to be disposable, we should also remember what body is being so characterized. It is our body, yours and mine, which is the place of our personal presence, the place through which we are linked to our world and to others, apart from which we can scarcely imagine our continuing identity. So whatever the usefulness of the disposable soma theory, and no doubt it's useful for many purposes, we may still wonder whether it is well suited to help us think about how we should relate as human beings to those who come before us and those who follow after us. But it's good to underscore the close connection that this standard explanation discerns between aging and reproduction. As John Medina puts it, the rule simply stated is this, if you have sex, you will eventually die. That's actually sort of helpful information for me to uh, <laughs> those of you who are younger and might want to think about that. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, the, the point is that fr from the perspective of the well-being of our species, there is very little reason to devote the body's energies to the tasks of cel cell repair and maintenance that are aimed at sust sustaining us into the years beyond uh, our reproductive years. And this same connection between aging and reproduction has been observed in studies of caloric restriction in rodents. Indeed, a rather drastic reduction in calories has been thought by some people to be the one almost certain method for retarding the aging process, even if we cannot say for certain how it works. Since the mid-1930s, researchers have known that dietary restriction seems to extend life. A diet containing normal healthy ingredients, but with 30 to 40 percent fewer calories than usual, has been shown to extend the lifespan of some mice and rats well beyond that of others whose food intake has not been 
so restricted. And the standard explanation for this seems reasonable. If food is scarce, the body's energy resources focus on cell maintenance rather than reproduction, increasing the animal's chances of surviving longer. Delaying reproduction extends the period, when the, when the, uh, the period of life when natural selection is effective. But of course, a price is paid. Caloric restriction is also closely tied to, de to delayed puberty and reduced fertility. And if not too far down the road, it becomes possible to manipulate the genome in ways that regulate reproduction in order to extend youthfulness and retard aging. The effect on our inclination to reproduce may be profound. It's at least incalculable in some ways. At any rate, however we account for the connection exactly, it indicates that aging and efforts to retard aging affect not only single individuals or even a single generation, but they have implications for the relation between the generations. If then we take the standard account of why we age and we try to derive moral advice from it, one's first thought might be, don't have children and I'll live longer. But that would be to misunderstand because nature is focused not on our well-being but on the well-being of our genes. So instead the moral advice might be, have children the more the better, the sooner the better. And in that way, we can be effective transmitters of our DNA and take our place in nature's larger undertaking. Indeed, anything, including living well into old age that makes us less likely or less eager to have children, seems contrary to nature's ongoing project. As one scholar puts it, from an evolutionary point of view, the name of the game is to play again. That is, the whole point of being a reproductive adult is to pass copies of your genes on to the next generation. Now if we are disinclined to try to draw such moral lessons from the account evolutionary biologists give, uh, we're, we're probably wise to be disinclined. There's probably good reason for that. That account may be able to tell us about changes that have occurred during our natural history, but they, it can't really tell us whether those changes are improvements. The fact that we can appeal to nature to support quite different versions of moral advice is a common aspect of our experience. In remembrance of his friend and colleague C.S. Lewis, Neville Coghill, uh, who was a longtime friend of Lewis's, once recounted a conversation that took place when he and Lewis were dining with Rector Marit of Exeter College. Coghill wrote this. Marit was a man of abundant genealog geniality and intelligence always ready with friendly freshets of conversation and new gambits of gossip to entertain a guest. Presently, he turned to Lewis and said, I saw in the papers this morning that there is some scientist fellow in Vienna called Voronoff, some name like that, who has invented a way of splicing the glands of young apes onto old, gen gen onto old gen gentlemen, thereby renewing their generative powers. Remarkable, isn't it? Lewis thought. I would say unnatural. Come, come, unnatural. What do you mean unnatural? Voronoff is a part of nature, isn't he? What happens in nature must surely be natural. Speaking as a philosopher, don't you know, Marat taught philosophy, I can attach no meaning to your objection. I don't understand you. I'm sorry, Rector, but I think any philosopher from Aristotle to say Jeremy Bentham would have understood me. Oh, well, we've got beyond Bentham by now, I hope. If Aristotle, if Aristotle or he had known about Voronoff, they might have changed their ideas. Think of the possibilities he opens up. You'll be an old man yourself one day. I would rather be an old man than a young monkey. <laughs> now, that uh, anecdote, um, which I actually first read years and years ago um, uh, and came back to more recently, uh, and more recently I discovered that it actually refers to a well-known episode in early attempts to develop anti-aging therapies. There was, in fact, uh, the, this kind of research uh, that went on, and the anecdote is therefore not just sort of amusing, but it's philosophically uh, to the point. We cannot we, we can be instructed by the account evolutionary biologists give us, but we cannot read our ethical principles off that account because moral reasoning requires something more complicated. The account given by evolutionary biologists tells us why, what, what is natural only in the sense of sort of what happens all around us, and that sense will give us very little traction when normative questions are our concern. What we're really, really looking for is something different. We're looking for the natural in the sense of a completion or a fulfillment of our inborn possibilities in ways that contribute to human well-being. 
And so we might ask then how from that perspective shall we think about age retardation, life prolongation, and the relation between the generations? How shall we sort of move beyond that, simply the account that the biologists give us? And so now I want to turn to the, uh, the second aspect of what I'm doing. As I've noted, once we have produced the, the next generation or past the age when we might have done so, nature doesn't work very hard to keep us alive. So that built deep into our biology is some kind of connection between reproduction and aging. We can, it seems, work to secure our own future, or we can commit ourselves to our children and others of their generation. I'm going to borrow the term generativity from the work of Eric Erickson, who can rightly be called the father of all life cycle studies. We, ha we have no term especially apt, I think, for naming the virtue that makes us ready, even eager, to produce those who will replace us and to sacrifice ourselves on their behalf. Generativity will have to do. If you have a better candidate, you can kind of tell me about it later. We'll jointly publish something uh, on it. Um, my name first, your second. Um, that's the way the scientists do it, you know. Um, uh, humanists uh, don't do that, really. But uh, one, one might, of course, argue, uh, and there's something to it, that this willingness to sacrifice for the next generation and produce it is not virtue, but simply animal instinct. And probably to some degree, that is true. But it's not just that. Thomas Hobbes, for instance, uh, didn't think that to be a sufficient explanation. And Hobbes was actually a pretty shrewd observer. Hobbes could think of no reason why parents should have or nourish children apart from the benefits that they would gain from their offspring. And only in that way could he make sense of the command that children should honor their parents. I mean, he couldn't understand it in any other way. We need to see if we can find something better to say. Erickson delineates eight stages of a life cycle. He actually, I think, late added a ninth, but eight is enough um, <clears throat> for most of us to make it through. Um, he delineated eight stages, in each of which he believes that a person needs to acquire certain strengths that make possible growth and development. And he characterizes generativity, which is his seventh stage, as primarily the interest in establishing and guiding the next generation. He does regard that as, to some degree, an instinctual power that sort of undergirds the various forms of selfless caring that adults provide. But it's more than that, because it has to be formed and shaped. It doesn't just uh, happen. As he himself notes, the etymological history of the term virtue has to do with a kind of strength or power by virtue of which we are enabled to act powerfully and effectively. And generativity has to be formed into that kind of power. There may, of course, be many ways in which we enact this concern to care for and guide the next generation, not only reproduction and parental nurture, but also the teaching of needed skills or the transmitting of a culture's system of meaning is all included in the virtue of generativity. But the most obvious and probably the most demanding expression of generativity is having and rearing children. Erickson observes on more than one occasion that human beings need to teach the next generation, whether through the obvious form of parental nurture or in other less immediate ways. And only through such care for the next generation do we avoid self-absorption. In Erickson's words, individuals who do not develop generativity often begin to indulge themselves as if they were their own one and only child. Now, we should never underestimate just how demanding this, uh, uh, this sort of parental care is. And it's demanding not only in the obvious ways that everybody uh, is aware of, the claims it makes upon our time, our energy, and our resources. It is also psychologically demanding in that it asks us to expend ourselves generously on behalf of those who will replace us. That's what puzzled Hobbes so much. It's hard to imagine any greater disciplining of, or perhaps even attack upon, our tendency toward self-absorption. Our desire to extend and secure our own future is to some degree in conflict with our need to teach the next generation and to leave behind us something of worth. Here, as so often when we think about aging, it becomes clear that the several goods we desire may be unable to coexist, or at least not very easily. Whatever the gain might be of retarding aging and extending life indefinitely, 
it could undermine the relation between the generations that shapes and defines so much of our life. Consider the following report of a conversation between Goethe and his friend Johann Eckermann. From the letters I've written in that period, said Goethe, I can see quite clearly how one has in every age in life certain advantages and disadvantages in comparison with earlier or later years. For instance, in my 40s, I was about some things as clear and clever as I am today, and in many respects, even better. But now in my 80s, I have yet some advantages which I would not exchange for the ones I had then. While you are saying this, Eckermann said, I envisage the metamorphosis of plants, and I understand very well that one would not like to return from the period of bloom to the time of leafing, nor from the stage of seed and fruit to the time of blossoms. Your simile, said Goethe, catches my meaning perfectly. Take a well-lobed, mature leaf, he went on with a smile. Do you think it would like to go back from its freest unfolding into the oppressive closeness of the cotyledon? Now, of course, perhaps some of us would like to. I mean, there might be some among us who would consider that trade well worth making. Human beings are, after all, considerably more complicated organisms than plants are. Like other animals and unlike plants, we are not rooted in place, but we are characterized by perception, desire, and movement. We transcend naturally given limitations to a much greater degree than any plant would. And still more, the, the human animal is marked also by a capacity for reflection, a capacity that brings with it greater possibilities for transforming natural limits. So however we sort out and rank the several goods at which a creature like the human animal might aim, we do need to recognize that these goods are to some degree incompatible. We cannot have both the indefinitely extended lifespan and the virtue of generativity. For the whole point of retarding aging is that we do not want to be replaced. So then, Biology teaches us that we may have to choose between age retardation and a generative commitment to the next generation, but biology cannot tell us what to choose or on what basis to choose. Perhaps in an age when there was relatively little that we could actually do to extend the maximum lifespan, it might have seemed that we could simply read off from our nature the importance of the virtue of generativity. But if so, that age is fast fleeting and our capacity for technological transformation of human nature will no longer allow us to take for granted an ongoing cycle of generations. So as the philosopher Richard Sherlock puts it, on the one hand, nature counsels against dramatic increases or changes in lifespan, and on the other, our natural attachment to life combined with our natural creativity and inventiveness leads us to pursue and possibly achieve a dramatic increase in our longevity which we were supposedly counseled against by nature itself. So when nature gives us these sort of mixed messages, it should be no surprise to find that some of us will prefer an indefinitely extended life to embeddedness within a cycle of generations and the aging that it necessarily entails. This seems to me to be kind of worth our thinking about and puzzling over, though other people see rather little cause for worry. So, for instance, Susan Jacoby once characterized Leon Cass's idea, though it's hardly an idea that was, was or is peculiarly Cass's, but she characterized his idea that people would be less likely to have children if the average lifespan increased significantly, and Cass has argued that. She, she characterized that as one of Cass's weirder scenarios. I'm not sure what other ones she had in mind, but um, uh, although I could probably actually make a few guesses, but... Um, but that's the way she characterized it. She thinks it, as she put it, odd to suspect that human beings would stop wanting to reproduce simply because they might live, they thought they might live to 100 or 120 rather than 80. And maybe so. But over against her intuitions, we might set Larry Temkin's view that, as he put it, speaking for myself, I think it would be terrible if I came to regard my mother or daughter not so much as a mother or daughter, but as a peer. And, and Temkin, in a comment that captures rather nicely the complex relation between life extension and the virtue of generativity, notes how odd it would be if such long-lived folk did, in fact, continue to reproduce. I, for one, he writes, don't relish the prospect that if only I lived long enough, I might no longer care about or even remember my first set of children. 
Jacoby, though, um, it was relatively unconcerned. She, she writes, none of the scientists involved in aging research have been talking about delaying puberty, the only imaginable scenario in which either sex or reproduction could be put off for the vast majority of people, much beyond the fertility window that now extends roughly from the mid-teens to the early 40s. Susan Jacoby one, wants to say, meet Stanley Shostak, author of a book called Becoming Immortal. Shostak has a plan, or maybe plan is too strong. He has at least a vision of how we might go about producing immortal human beings by using both cloning and stem cell therapy prenatally. Neither taken alone could provide immortality. Cloning simply replicates an organism but cannot su sustain the life of a particular organism indefinitely. And stem cell therapy, while it may rejuvenate an organism, cannot do so forever and simply delays the inevitable denouement. Put them together, however, and Shostak thinks we may be able to produce people who are equipped with a never-ending supply of embryonic stem cells that can rejuvenate their bodies. The idea is that as early as possible in embryonic development, we would replace the embryo's germ cells with a cloned blastocyst that would be a permanent generator of embryonic stem cells, a never-ending resource for bodily, gen uh, bodily regeneration. Is this possible? Is this plausible? I'm not the person to decide that. I don't know. But as I said at the start, um, even when uh, scientists uh, uh, offer suggestions that seem by our lights to seem uh, bizarre, um, it's, you're kind of foolish if you bet against uh, the possibilities of, uh, of modern science. At any rate, Here's his idea. In biological development, as we know it now, individual human beings are mortal. They age and die. But the DNA of their germ cells passes from one generation to the next and in that way is immortal. From the point of view of biologists, as Shostak puts it, achieving immortality, that is for an individual, for you or for me, achieving immortality simply depends on reversing these roles, creating an endless flow in the somatic line at the expense of the germ line. Now, what's he mean? We should be clear about what he means. He means producing people who, in order that they may be effectively immortal, must be sterile, and this is his sentence, must be sterile and remain at a pre-adolescent age forever, but otherwise appear and be perfectly normal. Now, I myself find it hard not to flag the word otherwise, uh, <laughs> so casually inserted into that sentence be sterile and remain at a pre-adolescent age forever, but otherwise appear and be perfectly normal, uh, as if one could be indefinitely pre-adolescent, you know, but apart from that minor technicality, uh, perfectly normal. But still, still we, we understand the point, and it's a point that sees the connection uh, that I've been talking about. In human development, as we ordinarily think of it, the aim is to become a sexually mature adult who is capable of producing the next generation, thereby starting the whole process over again. But this is a kind of development that is predicated on the opposite of individual survival. It requires that one generation give way to the next, and it defines maturity in precisely those terms. Thus, if we want not an endless round of individuals living out the life cycle, but rather immortal individuals no longer chained to the life cycle, we must cease to aim at maturity understood in its ordinary sense, at least as we've understood it up till now. And Shostak invites us to see such a shift, grabbing life, as he puts it, at the prepubescent stage and keeping it there, he invites us to see this as desirable. He writes, this means preserving human beings at a stage before they are completely developed and mature, but at which life is full of excitement, experience, learning, adventure, and above all, meaning. Imagine a pre-adolescent at the physiological age of about 11 living forever. Such individuals would be close to adulthood and capable of living a relatively fulfilling life, enjoying life, and contributing their creativity to it, albeit not reproducing. Immortal, these human beings would be forever young, never fully grown or sexually mature, but never aging. Now one wonders what a gathering of middle school teachers would have to say about this proposal. <laughs> but to be fair, Shostak does not actually necessarily suppose that everyone uh, should be immortalized by being permanently juvenilized in this way. 
but we could, he thinks, at least produce some individuals who, because they did not reproduce, would be well suited to live in a world with limited resources, and because they were so long lived, would have the wisdom to deal with new problems as they arise. Nevertheless, he also seems to regard, for anyone, a permanently healthy and youthful life as just desirable in itself. Such people, he says, will be intellectually creative and in a perpetual learning mode. A world of these immortals will be filled with intellectual excitement and dedicated to creative enterprise. One wonders about this, though. If Erickson was right, and human beings have a need to care for the next generation, just how fulfilling or how fully human will such a life be? We might at any rate remind ourselves of Goethe's alternative vision, his suggestion that a well-lobed mature leaf would not want to go back from its freest unfolding into the oppressive closeness of the cotyledon. Shostak himself sees some of these issues. In fact, he reflects in quite interesting ways on how the experience of time, for instance, might be changed for immortals produced in the way he envisions, if we could actually do it. Instead of living by the clock, he says, time will be immaterial for the immortals. It will be infinitely accessible, neither running down nor running out. These sorts of immortal creatures would have a hard time giving much sense to a term such as lifetime. They will experience many different moments of life, but those moments will not be recalled in seriatim, akin to the passage of time. Now, perhaps Shostak exaggerates what the experience of these immortals would be like, but imagine living in a constant present, having little experience of past or future. How should we characterize such a life? Is it perhaps a godlike existence? God, after all, is thought of traditionally as sort of existing in a, in a eternal present. Um, and, and is a desire for that sort of life the engine driving this program? I don't know, uh, but whatever we may think of these sorts of metaphysical reflections, the implication for life as we now know it and now live it is pretty clear, and Shostak sees it clearly. If we wish to eliminate aging, the implications will be enormous for sex and reproduction. In a world in which the lifespan has been indefinitely extended, there may not be much place for what I have called the virtue of generativity, little place for our most significant bodily relation. For the virtue of generativity is grounded in the succession of generations, in the fact that those whom we generate are not simply our descendants, but are also our replacements. We cannot yet even begin to carry out the sort of program of juvenilization that Shostak envisions, and perhaps we never will be uh, able to do that. that. It seems to me like one of the sort of rather more bizarre ideas. But as I noted earlier, were the day to come when we could, when our creative power over nature's givens had been developed that far, nature itself would not teach us whether such an advance was to be desired. Uh, would it really be an advance? Larry Temkin uh, directs attention to a Jewish prayer spoken to comfort those who have lost loved ones, and it offers an alternative vision of what's desirable. This is a, a part of the prayer. If some messenger were to come to us with the offer that death should be overthrown, but with the one inseparable condition that birth should also cease, if the existing generations were given the chance to live forever, but on the clear understanding that never again would there be a child or a youth or a first love, never again new persons with new hopes, new ideas, new achievements, ourselves for always and never any others, could the answer be in doubt? Well, I mean, it will be in doubt in our culture to some degree, but um, uh, perhaps shouldn't be. Perhaps that's unfortunate. Both the succession of generations nourished by the virtue of generativity and the free creativity that seeks to overcome uh, the need for that succession, both of those belong to our nature. Embedded by our finitude in time, we seek in our freedom to transcend it. A freedom that knows no limit at all, however, may begin to look more destructive than creative. That is why I think the qualitatively different life for which Christian believers have hoped has not been thought to be in any sense simply an extension of this life or the product of human ingenuity. As the gift of God, a new creation, it means being drawn into the life shared by God, by Father, Son, and Spirit. If we long for something more than an endless succession of generations, that is the condition toward which Christian hope should be directed. 
In the meantime, perhaps we should be more concerned to produce and nurture the next generation than to extend our own indefinitely. Now I, I move to my third, more explicitly uh, theological uh, reflection. Why then have children? For Christians, the deepest reasons, I think, are found in the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, in the way those sustain and transform our embodied life. They point to the deeper purposes that are served when we give birth to and sustain the next generation. The faith that it is worthwhile and good to pass life on to the next generation is grounded in a sense of gratitude for our own life. That anything, ourselves included, should exist at all, that there should be something rather than nothing, is a mystery. G.K. Chesterton, remembering an occasion when the sons of his elderly grandfather were criticizing the general thanksgiving in the prayer book on the ground that many people had little reason to be thankful for their creation, recalled his grandfather's reply. The old man, who was then so old that he hardly ever spoke at all, said suddenly out of his silence, I should thank God for my creation if I knew I was a lost soul. Beyond, before that sheer wonder of existence, we must simply bend the knee. That bent knee is nicely depicted and evoked in P.D. James' novel, The Children of Men, set in Great Britain in the year 2021. I think it was also made into a movie, wasn't it? I don't actually see many movies um, other than a few funny movies, but, um, uh, but I think it was. Uh, at, at, any at any rate, when the story opens, we learn that no children have been born anywhere in the world since 1995. All males have, for reasons unknown, become infertile, and hence the gift of life cannot be passed on, by the way, which shows, by the way, how quickly events may uh, succeed uh, P.D. James' vision, since we might be able to produce uh, gametes um, uh, uh, through stem cells uh, now, um, uh, which she hadn't envisioned at all as a possibility. She was still thinking in sort of old-fashioned ways at the time. But, but James helps us to feel what, what this sort of world would be like, presenting it through the eyes of an Oxford historian, Theo Farron. Fascinated with a young woman named Julian, Theo allies himself with a small movement to which she belongs, a revolutionary group aiming to overthrow the dictatorship ruling Britain. But such political means and goals are put to the side when Julian becomes pregnant. Julian needs to avoid detection until she has given birth, and so they turn to Theo for help. Coming by night to their hiding place, he needs to be convinced that she can actually really be carrying a child. Placing his hand on her abdomen, he feels the child kick, and Julian tells him to listen to its heartbeat. It was easy for him to kneel, so he knelt unselfconsciously, not thinking of it as a gesture of homage, but knowing that it was right that he should be on his knees. He placed his right arm around her waist and pressed his ear against her stomach. He couldn't hear the beating heart, but he could hear and feel the movements of the child, feel its life. He was swept by a tide of emotion which rose, buffeted, and engulfed him in a turbulent surge of awe, excitement, and terror, then receded, leaving him spent and weak." Put in terms of the theological virtues, gratitude for the sheer wonder of life, faithfulness to the gift we have been given, is at the heart of human procreation. And that is a rather different thing from just hanging on to the gift and attempting to perpetuate our own life indefinitely. Paradoxically, this may become clearer to us, I think, only as we age, only as we are no longer moved simply by the natural impulse to leave behind something of ourselves in our descendants. Indeed, as the poet John Hall Wheelock wrote, age is the hour for praise, praise that is joy, praise that is acquiescence, praise that is adoration and gratitude for all that has been given and not been given. Faithfulness to the life we have received, however long or short, requires that we see gift and grace at the heart of our existence, that we develop the capacity for praise for all that has been given and not been given. If faithfulness looks to the past, hope looks to the future. When in gratitude for the life we have been given, we generate others like ourselves, when we help to nurture and educate them, then we are acknowledging and accepting a world that we cannot entirely control or master. Hence, having and caring for children does something not only for those children, but also for us. It trains us in virtue. 
There is, we should not forget, a fundamental difference between a desire to reproduce ourselves or produce an heir and a hopeful spirit willing to give birth to those who will one day replace both us and our projects. This does not mean, of course, that we uh, should be or even could be utterly passive before the next generation. The children we produce, we also rear, nurture, and civilize. We pass on as best we can a way of life that is distinctively human. But if we are looking to the future in hope, we pass it on not simply on our own authority or as one final attempt of ours at mastery, but rather with confidence in God's continued commitment to his creation. Our care and nurture of the next generation should be in service of wisdom, not power. So the psalmist writes, I will utter dark sayings from of old things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders which he has wrought. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise to tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God. We cannot guarantee our children's future or the future of children more generally. Therefore, it is only with hope in power greater than our own that we can give life as freely as we have received it, that gratitude can give rise to generosity. Faithfulness looks to the past, hope to the future, and love delights in the present. Not just in one's own existence, though surely in that, but also in the relation between the generations that marks each present moment. Only thus can we be freed from the tendency to grasp the gift of life and keep it for ourselves. The deepest meaning of a gift, after all, is that it should not be grasped too tightly. It should be received and enjoyed, but passed on. Drawing on the legendary account of how Atalanta lost a race because she was distracted by several golden apples tossed by her suitor Hippomenes, who was thus able to defeat her and gain her hand, C.S. Lewis pictures really nicely the constant exchange that love involves. He wrote, the golden apple of selfhood thrown among the false gods became an apple of discord because they scrambled for it. They did not know the first rule of the holy game, which is that every player must by all means touch the ball and then immediately pass it on. To be found with it in your hands is a fault, to cling to it death. But when it flies to and fro among the players too swift for eye to follow, and the great master himself leads the revelry, giving himself eternally to his creatures in the generation and back to himself in the sacrifice of the word. Then indeed the eternal dance makes heaven drowsy with the harmony. Lewis here directs our attention to what Christians regard as the deepest ground of love, the mutual self-giving that marks the divine life of father, son, and spirit. Well before scholars such as Marcel Mose and Lewis Hyde had explored the complexity of gift exchanges, Christians worshiped a God in whom, from eternity, the Father gives all that he is and has to the Son. The Son offers that life back to the Father, a giving and receiving that takes place in the bond of love, which is their spirit. Our aim in life should not, therefore, be simply to perpetuate ours indefinitely. Indeed, to cling to it is death. The first rule of this game of life is enjoying it to pass it on, to establish a succession of generations. And in this way, by a kind of faint analogy, our life images the divine life, even here and now. As learning the first rule of the holy game, we give way to those who come after us. It turns out that the generative life is the only real alternative to the sort of self-enclosure that makes no room for mutual love, and that, in fact, is death. Why have children? Why should or need there ever be a generation other than our own generation? Because the generative life, the relation between the generations, is a school of virtue in which we learn grateful faithfulness to the gift of life we have received, generous hopefulness for those to whom we hand on that gift, and the love that freely gives what it has freely received. Shaped and formed in this school of virtue, we may come to see in our own lives that age is the hour for praise. Thank you.
thank you, uh, Gil. That was uh, careful, um, thoughtful, and illuminating. Um, and as you know, usually the respondent has to at some point disagree, nitpick, snarl, or at least damn with faint praise. Um, and often in the circles in which I travel, I'm typically the, uh, the odd man out and forced to disagree and give the contrary view all the time. Um, but gratefully tonight, I can just say yes. Um, that was great. Thanks. Um, I really, uh, really appreciate it. And the most uh, I think I can do for the uh, audience tonight is to um, uh, pick a few points to uh, amplify, perhaps probe further, perhaps stimulate some uh, further discussion. Um, I'm going to make uh, five of them that in some ways are probably digressions from uh, your uh, paper, but they were all stimulated by it. Um, it turned as more biological, um, and that others um, actually maybe even a bit more spiritual, um, and in no particular relation to the order in which you gave them. So, so the first one. Um, uh, the quote uh, is this, uh, the rule simply stated is this, if you have sex, you will eventually die. Uh, so says John Medina, as quoted by Professor Mylander. Uh, it's an interesting observation. Um, if the opposite were true, I might have seriously needed to reconsider my recent decision to leave the order of Friars Minor in order to marry. Because um, maybe this, this means that if you don't have sex, you live forever. Um, uh, yet, uh, I don't think I need to amplify any decisional regret about, uh, by fretting about my lost chances for immortality. Denying the antecedent is a common logical fallacy. See, even if you don't have sex, you still die. <laughs> uh, this has been amply proven by generations of amoebas and Franciscan friars. <laughs> <laughs> So I've not lost my opportunity for immortality after all. <laughs> um, one of the most interesting uh, claims in Professor Mylander's paper, however, um, is a modus tollens assertion, which is that if you don't die, you can't have sex. Um, as an ecological matter, um, that probably is true. Um, if an organism were to live forever and keep reproducing more of its kind, it would soon outstrip its resources. Um, a steady state of population of indefinitely living individual organisms would seem to preclude uh, reproduction. Properly stated, however, Professor Mylander's observation must be stated not as immortality uh, precluding sex, but as immortality precluding reproduction. Human beings are the only sexual organisms that have managed to uncouple sex and reproduction. Of course, there are lower organisms that reproduce asexually, um, but only human artifice has permitted sex without possible reproduction. Um, I don't know uh, that I'm sure what the implications of this are um, for considering the ethics of contraception, but the idea that contraception or sterility is a necessary condition for the utopian project of life extension might be one factor for us to consider. It's not a thought I've heard expressed ever in any explicit way, uh, but perhaps uh, the worries of the Catholic Church about contraception are in some ways an anticipation of this state of affairs as a kind of inchoate but ultimate telos um, embedded in contraception. Point two. Um, I could not agree more with Professor's Myland, Professor Mylander's uh, critique of genetic reductionism. Too much glib conversation about genes and social projects and ethics is suffused with genetic reductionism. You know, if you've heard it all before, genes are our blueprints, genes are the biological souls of organisms, our behavior is hardwired by our genes. Um, of course, at a moment's reflection, this is all absolute nonsense. Genes interact with other genes and are regulated in complex ways that we don't understand. Genes also interact with environments, and this has been known uh, for decades. And even apart from these epigenetic considerations, um, as Lenny Moss, formerly at this institution, um, points out in his wonderful books, What Genes Can't Do, DNA is not even the only source of information in an organism. Membranes, for instance, have a memory um, as lipid bilayers containing proteins that have, have been passed on and must be passed on from cell to cell over the whole course of evolution and during the development and maintenance of any organism. The plan is not in the genes of any organism, the plan for a membrane. 
put a genome in a test tube along with all the chemicals necessary to make a membrane and all the enzymes needed to read the genes and make the proteins that are needed to make a membrane, and you're not going to get a membrane. The organizing plan for membranes is in the membranes and not in the genome. And unless already enclosed within a membrane, genes can't even make a bacterium. Consider, for instance, the much-heralded work in synthetic biology by Craig Venter a few years ago in which he inserted a synthetic chromosome from one species of the bacterial genus Mycoplasma into a second species of that genus of bacterium that had undergone a manipulation to deactivate its native genome. What Venter showed was that the bacterium was transformed into the species of the inserted synthetic genome. And although he never quite said it himself, Venter made every comment possible to lead the media to report that he had created life in a test tube um, and that he was thereby on equal footing with God. Now, this was a remarkable technical achievement for which Venter justly deserves due praise. But no one who understands anything at all about religion ever believed for a nanosecond that his experiments challenged uh, the majesty of the deity. Um, the taglines about scientists now playing God were actually, if you read it, all written by atheists. Um, moreover, no self-respecting scientist ever concluded that he had created life in a test tube. First, he manufactured a synthetic version of a naturally occurring genome. He didn't make up his own genome from scratch. Second, and more to the point, he inserted this synthetic chromosome into the cytoplasm of another organism already enclosed in its own membrane. He didn't place the synthetic chromosome in a soup and make an organism. Genes can't function organismically without membranes, and membranes are passed on generation to generation. So what's a genome, after all? Um, I'd say it's this. It's the heritable information specified in nucleic acid sequences upon which an organism draws in generating its phenotypic response through the production of peptides or the regulation of their production in specific cellular, organismal, developmental, phylogenetic, and ecological contexts. Now that's a lot, but it's not everything. Our thinking about all these matters gets muddled when we don't even get the most fundamental concepts like what a genome is and what its limits are straight and begin to run away with our metaphors. The bottom line is this. DNA did not create life. Life created DNA. Third, I was inspired um, as well um, when I, uh, in reading Professor Mylander's work to return to an essay by, by Hans Jonas in the Hastings Center report in 1992. I think it may have been his last publication, actually. It was called The Burdens and the Blessings of Mortality. Jonas argues that an organism is a special form of being as doing. And the doing of an organism is to act against entropy. A rock, he says, will persist because of entropy. It is what it is and it stays what it is. An organism is a form of being that persists to the extent that it resists entropy. A living being is thus more than its constituent parts, all of which are governed by the law of entropy. An organism also is, at one and the same time, a sort of freedom with respect to its inert constituent parts and a state of radical dependence upon both the inert constituent parts that constitute it and those inert substances outside it that it needs to acquire in order to persist in being. For an organism, being is always a task, not a state. Moreover, Jonas argues, life carries death within it um, in the form of the non-living matter that constitutes each and every organism. If the most basic laws of physics are true, then no organism can actually ever be immortal. Life's battle against entropy will be lost unless individual organisms can pass their life on to offspring that can take on again and again and renew the task of living being, which is always a temporary stand against dissolution. And so the rhetoric of the immortalists is overblown. They can extend lifespans, but they cannot grant immortality. 
Calorie restriction will only get you so far. And animals without telomeres still have limited lifespans. Life-extending genes in lower organisms, such as one called DAF2 and another DAF16, appear to have multiple and more complicated effects in higher organisms. Embryonic stem cells tend to form tumors called teratomas. And Popper's law of unintended consequences looms large over the whole immortalist project. And so all these manipulations can do is extend lifespans. By how much and what the final limit might be remains uncertain, but they can only extend lifespans. Fourth, uh, even so, um, I share Professor Mylander's worries about the pursuit of life ex uh, span extension, even if it's not the path to immortality. We all want to stay alive, and most of us enjoy life, so why not go on living to be 120 or 150 or 200 years old? There are some consequentialist arguments that you can raise that hold some traction. For instance, um, we're having trouble finding enough young people to pay for Medicare and Social Security now. How will we do it if, they live to be, if we live, all live to be 150? And if the answer is to increase the retirement age, where are the jobs going to come from for the young people to pay for the old people? Uh, another question, were we ever meant to see our great, 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 great grandchildren? Or another question raised by Jonas. Will our memories be capacious enough to span a 150-year biography? What will we filter and forget? Another question, will we be bored? And what reasons will we have for goals if we have no deadlines? And if we're going to accept this, should we just slow all the phases of development equally? You know, adolescence is painful enough. We heard a little about pre-adolescence, but adolescence is painful enough at the standard six, uh, six years of 12 to 18. Socially, we've already extended it from 12 to 30, and, that, uh, and that's not been so great. <laughs> um, will teenage hormones still be raging at age 50? Um, or do we just arrest development and stop aging until death? Um, at what age should we do so? Um, the prepubescent pre uh, period we heard of, so as to retard population growth? And yet, beyond all these consequentialist considerations, are there any other reasons that might give us pause in this project of life extension? And the most fundamental reason I can see is this, that I think we're just made for eternity, that our whole being cries out against the laws of entropy, against the finitude that's our lot as creatures that we want, more than anything else, infinite life, infinite happiness, infinite peace, and infinite love. But indefinite ongoingness is not the same thing as eternity. More of the same is not enough to satisfy us. Our journey is not just one long drive from Chicago that never arrives at the Golden Dome. Indefinite ongoingness is not eternity. I want more than science can give. Fifth, and this brings me to my last point of reflection on Professor Mylander's excellent paper, his invocation of the supernatural virtues. These virtues of faith, hope, and love are both a call and a gift. They both call us to the eternal and come to us from the eternal. And I was really struck by his linking these virtues to pregnancy. See, every pregnancy is an adventure in faith, hope, and love. And although I'd configure these in relation to childbearing slightly differently from uh, Professor Mylander, I'd say this. To bring a child into the world is an act of faith in the human our flawed but essentially good nature. 
even in the face of radical philosophical propositions such as David Benatar's thesis that we are so corrupt that we have a moral duty not to reproduce our own kind. To bring a child into this world is also an act of hope. That there is a good in the future that is attainable, no matter how difficult, towards which we dispose ourselves and pass the torch to those who come after us to continue to pursue. And to bring a child into the world, at least if we do it in the old-fashioned way, um, is an act of love. It's the fruit of love, the objective correlative of the generativity of love. But what's supernatural about this? Well, I think we can only transcend ourselves by going beyond ourselves. And being finite creatures, this desire we have for the infinite, for the eternal, is impossible. Or it would be impossible if the impossible had not already happened. At least Christians hold that there is one pregnancy by which supernatural virtues of faith and hope and love become for us our call and our gift. As T.S. Eliot has written, here the impossible union of spheres of existence is actual. The hint half guessed, the gift half perceived, is incarnation. Faith in the love made flesh is real hope, transcendent hope, hope beyond hope. For behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, a name that means God is with us. Thank you. Thanks to both professors Mylander and Dr. Solmazy for extraordinary presentations. Now we have time for a conversation. We have two uh, microphones in the upper level. We have two microphones here. If you'd line up, uh, you can address your questions to Gil, and uh, we can ex extend our, our reflection. Who's calling on people, Carter? Who, who's, am I calling on people? You're in charge, and I do whatever you tell me. I'll stand next to you, just to, to make sure that uh, everything goes well. Tris Engelhart, you're first in line. First, I enjoyed the presentation very much. Can everyone hear my bad voice? Yes. I wasn't, I was very dubious that anyone has children, or at least more than a replacement rate of children, for faith, hope, or charity. Philip Longman and his bombshell of an article in 2004, pointed out the only people who reproduce are those who are members of fundamentalist, male, chauvinist religions. And they do it out of obligation. Liberals don't reproduce. That's why Brooklyn is full of Orthodox Jews. So the first issue is people, it seems to me, don't reproduce except by being commanded. That's number one. The others die out. And the second interesting issue is neither Orthodox Jews or Orthodox Christians are worried about life extension. What would be unnatural living as long as Methuselah? Nothing. Well, let me uh, respond briefly to the uh, uh, two points in order. Um, uh, I don't doubt that people do sometimes uh, reproduce simply out of a sense of obligation uh, to do so. Um, I'd be, I mean, I'd be surprised if that were uh, the, the primary uh, motivating uh, factor. Let me suggest you read a wonderful book by Ayala Fader called The Mitzvah Girl. And it's the story of Hasidic women in New York. And it's the basis of the Wall Street Journal pointed out in two generations. 
80% of Jews in the United States will be Orthodox. They went out to keep a mitzvah, an obligation to reproduce. Wonderful book. I recommend it. Oh, it's a, it's a mitzvah, but um, it's done especially uh, uh, in conjunction with the Sabbath uh, and the joy of the celebration of the Sabbath. And I don't think that um, it's, it's, that, that it's only... Uh, an obligation to meet a command that's happening there, but it's it's welcoming the Lord of the Sabbath, uh, who is the one who uh, who gives life. So that I think it's more. I mean, the uh, the the passage in Genesis to uh, be fruitful and multiply. You know, is it a command? Is it a blessing? Uh, is it both? Um, uh, uh, probably is both in some ways. But all I'm saying is that. Uh, uh, granting that uh, people may sometimes uh, set to work uh, simply uh, in order to uh, meet an obligation, I, I simply think that it's, uh, there's more going on than that. And the other thing, um, what would be wrong with living as long as Methuselah? Um, I don't know what to say about Methuselah uh, uh, himself, uh, but, but let me just say this. I, as uh, Carter said when he introduced me, I wrote a little book on uh, this subject, um, and I have to say that, uh, and I didn't expect this when I started working on this, when I started thinking about the, the whole project of age retardation and life extension, um, that of all the particular questions that I have thought about uh, over the years, particular moral questions that I thought about over the years, I have to say that I found this one among the, maybe the most puzzling uh, in a way, because uh, uh, in some ways just temperamentally even, but also for reasons, some of the, for instance, reasons of the sort that I gave one example of uh, tonight in terms of the relation between the generations, I think uh, there are lots of reasons to draw back from the, uh, the whole project. But if somebody says, life is a good thing, it's a gift of God, what's wrong with more of it? Um, uh, uh, why shouldn't I uh, enjoy more of it? Um, uh, I can't say that that's necessarily a bad thing, um, though I do think that oftentimes there's a good bit of narcissism mixed in with that, and there's a little more going on uh, than that. But, I mean, it really is uh, puzzling uh, in a way, and yet I think, um, uh, I think part of the answer has to do with, a, with an issue of the sort I raised tonight, and part of it has to do with a point that I made near the very end of the talk and a point that uh, uh, Dan Salmese, in fact, uh, expanded on, is it's not clear finally that what we really want, what we're made for and need, is just an indefinitely extended life of this sort, more of the same. Uh, what we're made for is something qualitatively uh, different, and that's why to hang on to this one forever uh, is death. Patrick Deneen. Uh, the same way that uh, uh, the same way that you suggested that you'd like Carter always to introduce you. I'd like to actually have you come over to our house afterwards and tell my children about all the things that parents are doing for them. Uh, <laughs> very very moving and very true, but not always appreciated until you have your own children. Uh, a few weeks ago, in one of the daily readings uh, in Mass, uh, the the second reading was drawn from um, the second book, uh, uh, Second Corinthians. And um, the line that struck me was, the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And uh, that seem, seems in, in its own way fairly obvious, and yet one, one could conclude that based on current practices and policies, uh, it's far from obvious. Uh, that uh, in, in almost every respect, it seems that the, the, the children are now laying up for their, for their parents uh, and grandparents. Which leads me to the question um, that you seem you framed your talk that science is going to force us to have to philosophize about the, this question of generativity. But I'm, I'm part of what I'm wondering is that aren't we already living in that world? Aren't we already occupying a world in which, in a sense, we've already experienced a profound assault on generativity in the absolute and objective sense that we're not having children, right? We're not reproducing ourselves already, even though we don't live forever. And in the kind of even policy sense that in, in, in so many respects in our public policy today, everything from the national debt um, to depletion of resources, um, a front page article in the Wall Street Journal today on how the healthy young are going to be supporting the elderly through Obamacare. 
in all of these manifold respects, we are already experiencing precisely what you seem to be describing is yet to come through the invention of science. So in a way, it seems like science will simply be a kind of period on, on the end of a long but, but a sentence that's already well written. And I guess I want to just press you on whether it's in a sense science that's doing this as opposed to something deeper built into the deepest presuppositions of our current way of life and even more deeply the philosophical and theological assumptions that govern us today. Uh, well, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, nice uh, point, which I'm not going to be able to do justice to. Um, but, but I'd say a couple things. Uh, one is that while it's, well, I'm not sure what the deepest presuppositions, I, I'm, not, I, I'm always doubtful that, uh, that we can actually articulate what our shared deepest presuppositions are uh, in our way of life. I'm not sure there is some single set. But, um, uh, Nevertheless, I grant that ours is not always, in fact, a world uh, friendly to children uh, in a number of ways, and that um, uh, if I were, uh, you know, a young person about to start earning a wage and lo looking toward the future, I would, you know, I would be concerned about uh, uh, some aspects of that. Though um, I, I don't think I would take it as far as you did at the start in the sense that. Um, uh, those children do owe the older generation a good bit. They can, you can never get back to an equal starting point uh, with the, uh, the parents who gave you birth. And so um, uh, don't whine too much too soon. Uh, that's, uh, that's sort of my uh, take on it. Um, uh, but having said that, I think that science in a certain sense is, is, is pressing us toward uh, uh, an even more fundamental question, not just whether we've screwed up the relation between the generations in certain ways that is inimical to uh, younger people, but whether uh, in fact um, uh, there's any reason not to radically restructure it uh, if it's within our power. You know, not, not just to accidentally find ourselves in certain social circumstances which we may or may not be able to claw our way out of, but whether in fact there isn't uh, a good reason uh, uh, to think differently about the relation between the generations. That's what science is inviting us to think about. Now it may cast new light on the kind of problems that you're concerned about and that would be uh, fruitful, but I, I think it's, it's forcing a slightly different kind of question. Yes, here. Uh, introduce yourself, please, before you ask your question. Yes. Uh, my name is Bill Murphy. I'm at the Pontifical College Josephina, and I want to thank both speakers for their remarks. And I had a question for uh, Professor Mylander. Uh, a couple of points in your, uh, in, in your reflections you, you made reference to, if, if I was hearing it correctly, the relationship between sort of the natural order or the biological order and the moral order if I heard that, and, and your, your point was that the natural order is kind of not enough to indicate the moral order, if that's what I was hearing. And so uh, I, I'm, from, from a matter of- uh, Bold of me to come to Notre Dame and say that? No, go ahead. No, ac actually, I'm, 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 I was delighted to, uh, to oh. hear that, and I'm just wondering if, if you could expand on the, upon that a little bit more and, and how you would see that applying more broadly to questions of uh, medical ethics. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if you have anything further, I'd, I'd be interested to hear that. Thanks. Yeah, I really should let uh, Dr. Salmazi answer that. He's the Catholic philosopher uh, here. Um, well, what I had in mind, really, um, and there's certainly more to say about it than, um, uh, than I said or maybe could say, but um, C.S. Lewis uh, uh, has a line um, in a in a work, if, even if you've read a lot of Lewis, the odds are good that you've not read Studies in Words. That's uh, not one of Lewis's most widely read uh, works, but as a, uh, Lewis was very interested in etymological uh, studies and has a little discussion of the word na nature and natural, and he says that, that natural is a word to conjure with. You can do all sorts of things uh, with it. Um, and uh, uh, the, the way in which um, uh, people and, and scientists sometimes often think of natural as simply what sort of goes on around us, um, uh, simply cannot provide uh, normative content, uh, finally. Um, uh, the perverse uh, is just as natural in that sense um, as the, uh, uh, the upright. Um, now, now, 
nature in the sense of, uh, uh, well, philosophers in recent years have liked the term flourishing, the flourishing for which we are made, um, uh, uh, that can provide uh, insight and content, but that's a notion that's normative already from the very start. Um, uh, there's normative language built into it, and um, uh, we're therefore, uh, we're not going to be able to arrive at it through any kind of uh, purely empirical observation. So it was the distinction between those several kinds of understandings of uh, what it might mean to think of something as natural that I had in mind, and I simply want to note that the first uh, way of thinking about uh, the natural, though perhaps no doubt important uh, for various purposes, won't help, uh, won't, won't uh, uh, give us the kind of moral insight that people sometimes uh, think we can, uh, we can get from that sort of investigation of nature. Uh, Brandon Vaidyanathan, Rice University, up top. Right, thank you. Thanks very much for your wonderful presentation. I wanted to ask you about uh, a slightly different connotation of gen generativity, which, which is um, in the sense of building something, you know, generating a project, uh, leaving a legacy. That's the way people talk about this. You know, I'm going to leave this legacy, whether it's lots of money or I'm going to build something and people remember me by. And I, and, I, and I wonder whether that links in any way to the mode of generativity that you're talking about when we think of people conceiving of children as projects. So I'm not even thinking of genetic selection, but even... Um, you know, needing a perfect school, you know, for children and having to deal with competitiveness. And I wonder whether there's some sort of conflation going on between these two modes of generativity in society where it's harder to think of generativity as you suggested because it's really the primary, the primary mode is this kind of project like, you know, mm -hmm. conceiving of children as projects. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on how that has come about or why. Thanks. Oh, well... The last, that's a, a curve you threw me at the end. I mean, I don't think I can tell you exactly how it's uh, uh, come about, but the po your point seems to be, um, se seems to me to be uh, uh, right on target. Um, if there is some kind of conflation between these two understandings of generativity, then I want to affirm one and, and re uh, reject uh, the other. Um, I said, in fact, at some point in the paper that, that the kind of... Uh, uh, attitude toward the next generation, uh, toward the relation between the generations that I was talking about, was something quite different from just uh, producing an heir or, you know, um, uh, uh, leaving a legacy behind. That, that seems to me um, not to capture sufficiently the kind of sacrificial commitment uh, to those who come after us that I wanted to be uh, affirming. Um, you're not wrong, of course, to say that uh, we have come to regard uh, uh, children as projects, um, even when, um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, e e even in very funny ways. Uh, uh, we might, um, uh, uh, my wife and I might uh, get um, uh, donated sperm and donated gametes and have the, uh, the uh, a fetus um, carried by a surrogate so that we could have a child of our own. That's exactly the way the language gets used uh, these days. Um, well, if that's a child of our own, it's only because we're the ones who conceived the project, funded it, and uh, uh, sought its execution. Um, that's all it uh, means at that point. Um, now, when we've gotten to that point, then the next generation really is our possession uh, in some ways, and that's very different from the kind of generativity that I was talking about. Yes, ma'am. Here, please introduce yourself. Yes, Edwina Maxim from Lexington College in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, in response to Professor Engelhardt, I had a reflection on your notion of creative generativity. And I wonder if there isn't something we could call dutiful generativity as well. That is, those people who take upon themselves uh, the responsibility to bring forth the next generation, who obey the command of the ultimate lawgiver of God, actually are making an act of faith, hope, and charity as well, in that they have faith in the lawgiver. They hope that he will give them the means with which to carry through the project that they are obeying, and that their love of God will bring forth the next generation. I just shared the thought. Uh, it's very nice. Um, uh, I cannot improve on it, though it won't stop me from saying something. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I really, I mean, it really is uh, really nice, but you, you reminded me of uh, something. Remembering that generativity is not just sort of producing our own children, but caring for the next generation. And you can, you, a person can have that virtue in spades and never, you know, 
biologically uh, have uh, children. Um, years ago, um, uh, when, when uh, we lived in Ohio, uh, we did foster care for a number of years. And one of the things that you had to do in order to uh, be recertified each year was you had to accumulate a certain number of little sort of like credit hours from going to things. Most of them, if I may say so, were pretty uh, uh, kind of dipsy do. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> And I, I, I used to always tell my wife that when the social worker came out to recertify us that the file in the uh, office would say, Mr. Mylander will complain about the courses he has to <laughs> attend. But um, uh, one of the things you could do to pick up a couple of these credit hours was go once a year to listen to an, for an evening with a family court judge, uh, the guy who handled the cases of these uh, children. Um, and it was always fascinating. It would, it would be in, I, we were in Oberlin, but it was in uh, Leary, a larger city uh, near us. and. Um, uh, one of the, the thing that I, that I was always most struck by went away. I mean, you know the difficulties that the African American family has had in our uh, society in uh, recent years. Um, uh, what you and, and had could have lost a whole generation, uh, certainly of fathers uh, uh, at least. What you had at those meetings, um, uh, there were a lot of black people there. They were almost all grandparents. Um, dutifully generative um, uh, in, uh, in your very nice sense. These were not the children that they had themselves produced. They were the children of their children. Um, but these people at um, you know, fairly uh, advanced age were uh, uh, taking up the task of trying to sustain that uh, next generation. Now, they were doing it out of love and concern for those children, also, though, I think, with a kind of dutifulness. And I mean, so there is some way in which these things uh, interact, and it's very powerful uh, when you see it in action, very powerful. Yes. Um, William Stigall, I'm from uh, Medical City Children's in Dallas and the University of Dallas Philosophy Department. Um, I wanted to push you a bit on your is-ought um, distinction there, that we can't get normative morality from evolutionary biology. And I wonder can't, if- You can't push so mazy on that, huh? You have to push me. Good, no, go ahead. Well, um, <laughs> Yeah, I did say it. But You're he right. agreed with everything you said, though. Uh, is what I got. It's an amazing spot. Um, I wonder if you're really criticizing a particular presupposition of a kind of biology rather than biology itself. And what I mean there is, um, for instance, uh, Dr. Mazie sort of started to mention um, systems biology, like Nicanor Astrioko is up to in Providence. The idea that um, you can't just look at the gene and see um, life coming from that, that uh, DNA is presupposed by a life form. And so that immediately takes you up from a level from the reductionist uh, materialism of just looking at the genome. But there's another level of reductionist biology too, which is, would be just looking at the individual uh, as, the, um, as the focus of biology. And this is a modern notion of biology, right? I mean, Aristotle's biology doesn't take the individual as the fundamental unit, he takes the family. And so as social animals, then, there are going to be goods of those social animals um, that won't be able to be completed by the individual alone. Um, you know, the most obvious example is that males need females. Females need males to have the next generation. So then that's a species. Sort they of they used to, anyway. I'm not sure they still well, do. Well, um, if you look at other higher order social animals, then, um, uh, elephants, apes. Mm -hmm. Elephants uh, require uh, an adult bull male to, to, to stamp down adolescent elephants. Uh, otherwise, the adolescent elephants go around killing everything. So the species literally can't survive if there aren't these older, you know, gray-haired elephants there. So evolutionary biology then um, could, could force you to see that there are these notions about humanity then that also cannot be fulfilled without having post-reproductive age adults around. For instance, uh, it's, it's known that testosterone is an immunosuppressant. So as a, um, as a, as a pediatrician, there's a, uh, there's a notion called the, the wimpy white boy syndrome. And, and what this means is that um, white and male children are affected by any genetic disease more than other children. So, so there's, a, there's a natural disparity in the uh, male to female ratio. So testosterone is probably the reason why this happens is because it's an immunosuppressant. So if you, if you live your life filled with testosterone, then uh, you're going to be susceptible to all sorts of things. So there's an evolutionarily derived pull then to have a lack of testosterone, which is one of the causes of aging. And then you have males around who are not immunosuppressed, 
and males around who also have this experience and are now not also trying to compete for uh, resources, females, and reproductive capacity. So even from an evolutionary biology perspective, you can say there's a reason that we age. I really do appreciate all the faith, hope, and love, the theology, but I think you can also get to it from science um, and that I wouldn't give up the normative aspects of biology just quite yet. You're probably going to have to write that out for me, um, uh, for me to do uh, justice to it. Uh, what I'm about to say, you probably will not think uh, does justice to it, and may well not. Um, but um, just sort of granting the, the basic point that you're making, um, uh, the, the fundamental claim that I made about our human nature is that we are both Im embedded in the finite world and transcend it. We indefinitely uh, transcend it. Now, I think the reason we indefinitely transcend it is the reason that Denzel Maisie talked about, namely that because ultimately we're made for God. But um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fact that, uh, that our nature both embeds us in that way and invites us constantly uh, to transcend it in ways that may turn out to be creative and good and may turn out to be destructive, uh, uh, suggests to me at least that if we're talking about human beings and not other uh, animals, though maybe the same might be true of some other animals, um, but if we're talking about human beings, um, uh, we, we, we won't be able necessarily to get everything we want to say simply out of an investigation of their biological and social uh, uh, the structure in, the structures in which they are embedded. Um, uh, it's gonna, that's going to miss an important truth about uh, our human nature, um, a truth which, you know, alas, does kind of mess things up uh, sometimes as well, but it still seems to me to be the case. That, I, I think that would be my, if you wrote it out for me and I had a chance to think about it, I think that would be uh, something like that is what I'd say, but that may not do justice, to, uh, you know, to your point. So I, I will agree because I'm also Catholic, and I will believe that there are truths that I can't know uh, simply by looking under a microscope. Um, but as a Catholic and a Thomist, uh, I flinched when I heard a new virtue that Thomas hasn't mentioned, generativity. And I wonder if um, you could use the Thomistic virtue of pietas. Um, he says this is the, the virtue of joy and thankfulness and gratitude for things not deserved and um, works not done by ourselves. And so the only response to those things is to also pass those things on. I, 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 you know, I have, uh, if, if it can capture everything that I wanted to capture with generativity, I'd be pleased. Uh, that, that'd be fine. I don't, I don't feel quite the same urge to find everything in the Summa, but, um, <laughs> uh, but that's fine. Okay, that's, uh, that's all the time we have for questions, but we can continue our conversation in the reception uh, next door. Thank you to both again to my letters and